by the prints of the nails in his hands. As you're seated, take your copy of God's Word and turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Our brother and sister Scott and Denise Crone are going to lead us in the reading. This is the text this morning from Pastor Kevin's message. Revelation chapter 6. This uh, contains six seals, and so they will alternate the reading between every other seal. So Scott and Denise, come and read the scriptures to us this morning. Good morning. Revelation 6, verse 1 and following. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Verse 16 of that chapter presents an iconic, contradictory, paradoxical, and really incredible phrase. Do you see it? Notice it said, the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. Wrath of the lion, we can understand. The sacrifice of the lamb, we could understand. But a lamb is meek. 
a lamb is passive. It's not aggressive. It's, it's, it's not going to do harm. There are few animals less threatening than a lamb. Yet here in Scripture, in this chapter, we today are called to contemplate the wrath of the Lamb. Father, I pray you would just help us today as we think about the six seals that are presented here in Revelation chapter 6. I pray you would help me and help this audience and help those who are watching online. Lord, that we would come to understand the beauty of your wrath. That we, your people, would rest in the protection that we have and the confidence that we know we have in you. And Lord, I pray for anyone who would be listening to this live or later recorded, Lord, that they would understand that there is an escape available. There is one they can turn to and find salvation. And his name is Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. You'll recall this morning that from chapter 5, the last chapter we've looked at together, that it was only a lion-like lamb that was found worthy to open the scroll and unleash its content. The scroll is going to be opened as we study through Revelation. That scroll is the book of Revelation, and we know how it ends. We know it ends with this very lamb enthroned in glory, receiving worship that he alone deserves. But sadly, not everyone today is singing Worthy is the Lamb. Sadly, today, many people, maybe who are even here and watching online, aren't saying He alone should receive power and riches and wisdom. And it's because they're not acknowledging Jesus as their Lord and Savior. A major part of growing, going from where we are today in our understanding of who we are as a church and winding up through the study of Revelation to where it ends with Christ enthroned in all eternity in the body of Revelation is understanding this judgment that the Lamb brings upon those who reject Him. In the garden, God established a principle. And that principle is very simple. The principle is sin brings death. The day you eat is the day you die. So when Adam rebelled, Romans chapter 5 tells us that death separated all men because all have sinned. And verse 18 of Romans 5 says that through one man's offense, judgment came upon all men, resulting in condemnation. So as we study in the book of Revelation and see the judgment, you say, why in the world does judgment need to fall? Well, the answer goes all the way back to Genesis because one man sinned, and we've all sinned, and we've all earned wrath and judgment and condemnation. But that same verse goes on to say, praise the Lord, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification to life. Aren't we thankful this morning for that one righteous man, Jesus Christ? And that through his gift of death on the cross, we can have righteousness and avoid the judgment that we have earned. Well, the cross of Jesus Christ paid for our sin. But sadly, again, many today still refuse to come to Christ. Many refuse to shelter in Him. And because of that, as we learn through Revelation, they will face God's wrath, the wrath of the Lamb. So the body of the book of Revelation describes the unfolding of God's judgment in three series of judgments. The, the judgments are known as the seal judgment, 
the trumpet judgment and the bull judgments. And they kind of unfold in seven phases or stages. Um, And they fall on a rebellious world and unbelieving people. Now, some people, when they read Revelation, because they approach them one after the other, they tend to think that they come on earth sequentially. One happens and ends. The next one happens and ends. The next one happens and ends. And, uh, and so in that sense, they could kind of put a, a chart together and map. Here's the seven, you know, seal judgments and then the seven trumpet judgments and then the, the seven bowl judgments. I, I think the danger in that is that then that's how they look at the judgments. And I think a more helpful way to look at the, the series of judgments in Revelation is that they are not sequential, but cyclical, in that one begins and the next one builds on it, and the next one builds on it, the next one builds on it, and so forth, kind of like a rolling wave that is growing in intensity, and, and judgment that's growing in severity. I think that can be demonstrated in the fact that the first series of judgments, the seals, impacts a fourth And then the next one impacts a third or a greater percentage. And the the final series impacts the whole, all. So we see the growing intensity and severity. Each of the three series seems to culminate with with the the same event being described. The, The final moments, what the prophets of old called the day of the Lord, this victorious return, this this judgment of all enemies who stand against him and the enthronement of Christ. So as we look at the first series today in Revelation chapter 6 called the Seal Judgments, we are, I think, helped if we think of these as preparatory judgments. So if you think about it as a book that might be sealed, if there's seven seals on it, before we can open and read the book, we have to start breaking the seals and the seals get, help get us ready for what the book will Um, reveal. That's kind of what these seals judgments are functioning like. The judgments that we will look at today were specifically identified by Jesus Christ in the Olivet Discourse. And I'll reference Matthew 24 a number of times to continue your study of these judgments. It would be helpful to go back and read Matthew 24 on your own. But Jesus, in the same order that John presents them in the the four horsemen of the apocalypse and so forth, Jesus already presented them in the Olivet Discourse in the same order that we said uh, saw this morning and read this morning. And in verse number 8, Jesus says, of these judgments that are coming, he says, these are the beginning of sorrows. These aren't the great tribulation. These aren't the unfolding of all of God's wrath. This is just the beginning of sorrows that we need to be aware of. So as we study God's judgments, the Christian should not respond today to the sermon that you hear with dread. You shouldn't walk away afraid, Christian. What you should do is hear this truth and leave with zeal. You should leave with faith. You should leave invigorated. You should leave with confidence. You should leave with purpose because you understand something about your Savior more clearly. Because He's revealing not just the love of Christ, which is often the focus in a church, but we are seeing the justice and judgment of Christ, and God has put that judgment in His hand. And He is executing it. And we will see how He will do that. So Christian, be encouraged today. Let me suggest two specific textual reasons why we should not live in dread, but as believers, we should have zeal. Not have fear, but faith. First of all, in the text, we see that Jesus is not indiscriminate. This is, this is all introductory. This is, this is not the sermon yet. Okay, Jesus is not indiscriminate with the judgments. Jesus is in control of the releasing of all of these judgments. I want you to see in each of these, Jesus controlled the unleashing of the seal. Right? Verse number one, I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals. Verse number three, 
when he opened the second seal. Verse number five, when he opened the third seal. Verse number seven, when he opened the fourth seal. Verse number nine, when he opened the fifth seal. And verse number 12, I looked when he opened the sixth seal. And the concluding statement from the ones being judged in the end was it was very clear who was bringing the judgment. It was from the wrath of the Lamb, which they couldn't stand against. Jesus is in control of the releasing of all of these judgments and the extent to which they have been given power. Of the four apocalypse, three of them, it says, it has been given to them something. Right? Well, who gave it to them? The one who unleashed them. The one who turned them loose. Jesus is in control. It's not indiscriminate. Sometimes when we think of judgment, we think of the Pandora's box where evil gets unleashed on the world and once it's out of the box, evil is uncontrollable and it has its way and there's no one who can stuff evil and crime and sin and wickedness back into the box. Friend, that is not true. Jesus is in control of all the events of this world Now there's a second textual reason why we should not be in fear today, but we should live in faith today. And that is this, believers are not the target of these judgments. A common question I get when we begin to look at the judgments here is will Christians experience any of these judgments? Well, that's a good question. The answer is yes and no. Okay? Yes and no. Say, Pastor, that's not helpful. Well, let me explain. Let's start with the no. No, we will not experience these judgments in the sense that we are the target of them because the, uh, the Lamb is pouring out these judgments on those who have rejected Him. And no, in the sense that God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation... Through our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Hasn't the Lord Jesus borne all of the wrath of your sin? Certainly He has. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 tell us that the rapture of the church is comforting words. Words that inspire faith and courage, not fear and dread. And in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, when speaking to the Philadelphia church, the faithful church, they were encouraged that the Lord said to that church that He will keep them from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world. So no, no. But yes, yes. Yes in the fact we will experience some of this effect, I would call it residual effect because we live in a world of sinners whose sin often splashes on more than just the one who commits it. We will see in the fifth seal that there are followers of Christ who were beheaded or suffered as a martyr because of their testimony, because of their witness. Now they're not suffering on account of punishment or wrath, But they are suffering in this season nonetheless. And yes, in the fact that we, according to Paul and according to Christ, are already living in the latter days. Billy Graham said back in 1983 in a book that he wrote about the four horsemen, he said this, the shadows of all four horsemen can already be seen galloping through the world at this moment. If that was true in 1983, how much more true is it today? The shadow of the sealed judgments are looming large and could appear in full at any time. So, no dread, Christian, today. Zeal. No fear. Faith. As we approach these seals, as we contemplate the wrath of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 6 unpacks for us 
six components of the wrath that will be unleashed on this rebellious world. Notice the first component. The Lamb's wrath will escalate toward death and hell. That's what the first four seals tell us. The four horsemen of the apocalypse go together and show us that judgment comes from the Lamb in an escalating manner on mankind, even by mankind. These infamous four horsemen of the apocalypse are are symbolic. They're not real individual people who are riding. There aren't literal horses that are being ridden. But what is demonstrated here in this, in this, in this uh, chapter is what happens in human hearts when they deny the authority of their Creator and they reject the atonement of their Savior. Think through these four horsemen and this progression. The first horse, the white horse, who is it? Many say it's Christ. When you look at Revelation 19, there's really no resemblance. It's not Christ. Some say, well, it's the Antichrist. I think it's, in a sense, too early in the study of Revelation for us to encounter the Antichrist. What is it? I I think both of those interpretations fall short. What is it? I think there's a third view, and that is that this rider of the white horse is the spirit of deception that brings conquest and tempts to independence that throws off the authority of Christ. It's the spirit that embodies every antichrist who has ever lived in this world from John's day to our day and will continue as they proliferate, offering false salvation in autonomy. This rider keeps company with the other three. We don't separate the four horsemen. This rider rides or connects with war, famine, and plague. And Jesus warned us in Matthew chapter 24 that we are to be on our guard because there is going to be deception and false Christs. So the the rider comes in white, deceiving, imitating the righteousness of Christ, imitating victory, wearing the Stephanos, or the victor's crown. But there is no victory found in him. The first century Christians, as they would have read this from the hand of John, as it was read in their church congregations, would have maybe thought of the Parthenian warrior who fought against Rome and even won twice, maintained their independence from Rome. They were excellent markmen, known that with the bow, riding at full gallop, they could hit their enemy at a mark. But the Parthenian reference, I think, provides background, not meaning. Rather, the image of the rider on the white horse points to the propensity of sinful human beings to take things for themselves, what we might call a lust for conquest. It's a picture of human depravity that says, I want to be the victor. I want to be in charge. I want to rule it all and I'll destroy what I need to destroy to get there. Imagine living in a world where everyone is striving to be number one. Ah, we don't have to think too hard about that, do we? You say, Pastor, that doesn't sound like it's too far future. It kind of sounds like the way a lot of people live today. I think we can hear in this the echo of Satan's lie in the garden. It can be heard as he says and whispers, Hath God said, wouldn't it be better if you didn't have to listen to him? Wouldn't it be better if you were just in charge yourself and you could Pursue your own agenda. Well, that's the first seal. But he's connected to the second seal and this 
judgment grows. We find the red horse, the rider on the red horse turns from a lust of for conquest into civil war. The rider is given three things by God, the ability to take peace from this earth, to cause people to kill each other, and to use a sword to accomplish its bloody purpose. W.A. Criswell said of this rider, the red horse represents not only nations rising against nations or kingdoms against kingdoms, but more nearly the terrible slaughter of class fighting and party fighting party, as in civil war. Fighters ambushed in the night and they assassinate in the day and they murder at twilight and at noontime. And everyone lives in a constant fear for his own life. Again, Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 10, speaking of this time, then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. This red horse bathes the earth in bloodshed, in civil war, and people killing each other. The word anarchy rings true. Well, leaders fear civil war or anarchy more than they fear their enemy. They're destroying each other. Maybe we hear in this writer the echo from Genesis chapter 6 when Jesus or I'm sorry when God looked out on the land and he surveyed the, the mankind and the humanity that he created and he was distraught and he looked and said the earth is filled with violence and instructed Noah concerning the ark and the flood that would come well the third seal brings after this civil war, a, a horse of famine. The rider is holding scales and balances in his hand, and John hears the, the going price for wheat and barley, and it's 10 and 12 and 16 times the normal rate. You'd have to work an entire day just to feed yourself. You're out of luck if you've got a family. You can barely feed yourself. After living through the toilet paper scare of 2020, I think we've all learned a little bit more about the law of supply and demand. And when things are scarce, the demand goes up and the price gouging increases and inflation is unstoppable. And that's what we see happening for wheat and barley. But there's a hold on oil and wine. So while the poor are struggling simply to have food, the wealthy are retaining their supply of oil and wine, further driving the disparity between the haves and the have-nots, creating more civil discord and unrest. The net effect is the increased amount of injustice and inequity and a lack of concern for anyone else in the community as long as I've got my belly full. The fourth rider is ghastly green and pale, the color of leprosy in the book of Leviticus. Death came for the body riding on this horse, and hell was riding with him, coming for the soul of mankind. This rider brings pestilence in the plague and is given permission to kill up to a fourth of the world's population through various means, some of which have already been described. In today's number, it would be over one and a half billion people more than died in all the wars of the 20th century combined death overtakes humanity in his book the city of death francis schaeffer said of our modern world that the dust of death is on everything and his diagnosis is is accurate. The dust just grows thicker until this great day of the Lord and His purposes are accomplished. Maybe you've noticed a progression or connection between the four horsemen. Conquest, together with civil war or civil unrest, leads to famine and brings death. 
I want you to notice that escalation or that progression of the horsemen that though they are controlled by Christ are the natural result of man believing Satan's lie all the way back in the garden. That if you do this, you can be God and be in control and have the the plenty of the garden for yourself and you don't have to listen to anyone else. We see it manifest in the behavior of Cain. Who went after the person who honored the Lord, his brother, and took his life. Did not want to worship God according to God's dictates. We see it in the book of Judges. When everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. The nation of Israel ends in in bloody civil war, tribe against tribe. Say, Pastor, why is it important today that we see the wrath of the Lamb growing in this way in the hearts of mankind as they sin against each other? Isn't that far off? Well, I think in a very spiritual sense, this progression is taking place today. Spiritually, mankind longs for independence from God. We want to rule our own lives. We throw off God's law. And we begin to view other people around us no longer as individuals to serve and love and care for, but people to use to build up our own kingdom. And through lust and hatred, We plunder the innocent around us and we murder our competition. The famine of God's Word increases as sin keeps us from the book and the draught of hearing God's truth grows. And if a person persists in this rebellion of the heart against Christ, this rejection of the Lamb, if they don't call upon Him and find salvation, they receive eternal death. And hell comes riding for their soul. This example of of Christ's wrath is consistent with what the Scriptures tell us the wrath of God is like. Romans chapter 1 tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because they may not, uh, uh, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. They reject Him. They, They turn a blind eye to Him. So how does God in Romans 1 judge? How does His wrath unfold? Well, it says in verse 24 that God gives them up to uncleanness. And it says in verse 26 that God gives them up to their own vile passions. And it says in verse 28 that God gives them over to the the debased mind that is driving their debased actions. And where does God just simply saying, okay, your judgment is you get to think the way you want and act the way you want and behave the way you want. Where does that take humanity? Well, it ends. Romans 1 says, In all unrighteousness and sexual immorality and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and evil mindedness, they're full of whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things. They're disobedient to parents, they're undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving and unmerciful. And it says, they know the righteous judgment of God, but they continue to practice the way they want. Like they're thumbing their nose at the wrath of the Lamb. And they approve of other people who practice just like them. I wonder today, friend, What direction are you progressing? 
Are you progressing toward death or toward life? You say, Pastor, today I I could never murder someone and go in that direction. But Jesus asks the question, are you hating anyone in your heart? Sin brings death. The pattern we see in the horsemen is God gives men the full impact of the life that they choose, both spiritually and ultimately physically. Your decision today concerning the Lamb matters. Well, what about a broken world in which we live? Is there any solution in this as we contemplate our world to help them avoid this impending apocalypse? Well, certainly these these writers remind us that in our attempt to help this world, it is better for us to focus on individual salvation rather than national salvation. And to call individuals to personal submission to the Lamb rather than call for social reform or urge financial donation or gender equity. That's not where national salvation would be found. That's not how we avoid the apocalypse. It is individually oriented and it is focused on the Lamb as the solution. So practically for a church, as we have done, spending an entire year and a half preaching from God's Word through the Gospel of Matthew, which calls us to recognize that Jesus is the King and that we are to submit to His authority and that we are to seek first the Kingdom of God certainly lines us up with the Lamb's progression of the seals and His judgment and the answer for sin. Our broken world needs to submit to the King. Yet what we are experiencing is that we are fi- this world is finding new and twisted ways to thumb their nose at God. And that approach to the Creator will just roll up on itself a heavier and more intense judgment from the Lamb. So the first component is the Lamb's wrath escalates toward death and hell. Secondly, the Lamb's wrath avenges the blood of the martyrs. Verse 9 through 11. We see in this, the fifth seal, an altar... And the souls who have been slain for the word of God and the testimony with which they held. And they cry out. Maybe the sword that was given wasn't just civil war, but potentially a focus on those killing those who named the name of Christ. And as we move from the four horsemen to the fifth seal, the scene shifts from sinners to saints and from earth to heaven, specifically the heavenly temple, which the Old Testament often referenced, and certainly the book of Revelation references, and we find in this temple an altar. And from that altar, there is, well, there is a sacrifice that has been slain. It was the saints. And there's a prayer, or in a sense, incense, that's going up to the Lord as, as we read that prayer in verse number 10. And what we find here is is not just the negative judgment of God emphasized in the first four seals, but the positive justice of God in the fifth seal. In the Old Testament, the positive justice of God is known as this, an eye for an eye principle. Right? If you do something, God righteously and justly exacts the same from you in judgment. The eye for an eye principle. Well, verses 9 through 11 shows us that the slain under the altar cry out and that God hears their cry. He receives their sacrifice. They were slain or slaughtered. And now, isn't it interesting why they were slaughtered? This is instructive for us. You see, the Christian response in the sin sick world is not to back up and become passive and not to say anything about the trajectory they're on. Just the opposite. 
It says they were slain because of their testimony. They came out and spoke the words of life in a dark place. They became a point of light. They they brought truth to those who needed truth. And because the, the, the world didn't want to hear the truth about a God who rules supreme, instead of attacking God, they attacked those who brought the truth. Now, friends, I hope you see in this the pattern through all the Old Testament and even in the New Testament of prophets who came and brought truth to people who denied God and His authority and said, we'll just do away with the prophet. Well, that's certainly what's taking place here. W.A. Crisrow reminds us whenever in the Bible, wherever in the Bible, we find a true prophet of God standing up, this will be his message, that unless we repent and get right with God, and unless we turn, there is coming down upon us a judgment and a visitation from the Almighty. I think this is instructive for us to leave today with a zeal to let the world know that unless they repent, this judgment of the Lamb will fall. Well, they, they were killed. Now they're crying out for justice. This is the only prayer of supplication in, in the apocalypse. It's short, it's simple, but it begins where it needs to. An acknowledgement of God as true and holy. And then it pleads for justice. Now some look at this and they say, this cannot be a Christian prayer. We must always pray the prayer of Stephen. Lord, lay not this to their charge. And I think Stephen was personally praying that for the people right there in front of them. But I think what we see here in Revelation in this fifth seal is the prayer is more like the imprecatory prayer of the Psalms that are good and righteous prayers that are saying this, Lord, the enemies surround us, and for your namesake, would you destroy these enemies? For your glory, for the holy hill, for Jerusalem, for your people's sake, for you, God, would you vindicate evil done against you and your people. This is a righteous prayer. It's not motivated out of revenge or personal vengeance, but out of a desire for divine justice. And you know something? God hears this prayer. God was speaking to Cain and He said this, Your brother's blood is crying out to Me. He understands when an injustice is done. And so the saints here are encouraged to rest because God has a plan. And God's providence is working out this plan. And God's plan for Christians is to be a gospel witness today, to proclaim the truth and to offer this hope in Christ. Yet this plan that God has for us may It may end up with your life being taken. It may end up with you being canceled by this culture. It may look like a loss of friends or a loss of freedom. But it's part of God's plan. And He will vindicate those who suffer at the proper time, which will be soon. So we can leave here today encouraged with zeal and faith. We can rest even when we suffer. Why? Pastor, why? Well, because God's delay in bringing judgment does not mean He doesn't know. God's delay does not mean He doesn't care. God hears your prayer of suffering. And He will meter justice. And it will be done. So you can rest. You can rest today. Secure. Not in the acceptance of this world, but the protection that is in Christ. You see, He gives a robe of righteousness to each of those martyred. And that robe of righteousness garners them an entrance into the glory of God the true and holy one. We can rest when we suffer. For those who have not yet been martyred or canceled or ridiculed, 
This is a good reminder not to be surprised that it will come or dread that reality. The Lord's plan is a good plan. And it's clear in the fifth seal, His plan is not to shield all those who name the name of Christ from pain and suffering. Grant Osborne provides this summary. The emphasis is on God's omniscience and sovereign control of history so that the suffering of each one of us is part of His perfect plan. This does not mean God causes this suffering. Rather, He knows it is coming and has planned to use it for, uh, to, to benefit His faithful and bring them victory. So as we consider in our text the wrath of the Lamb, we see it escalates toward death and hell and that it avenges the blood of the martyr. But thirdly, the wrath of the Lamb ultimately encompasses the whole earth and exposes everyone's depravity. There's a universal component to the wrath of the Lamb that the sixth seal shows us. It has effects both on the created order and on the created being. What is being depicted here in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 through 17, is the end of the age, the imminent end of the world, depicted by the shaking of the earth in such a violent, cataclysmic way that nobody could mistake it for what it is. It impacts the terrain, and that the mountains dissolve and the islands disappear. It impacts the firmament in that the sun changes hue and is darkened during the day and the moon looks like the the haze from volcanic ash at night. This scope is wide. It's worldwide. It's universal. It's referred to by Isaiah the prophet and Ezekiel the prophet and Joel that we read this morning in chapter 2. Jesus referred to it in Matthew 24 when He said this, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. See the connection? What's described in the sixth seal is verse 29, and we know what comes after it, but this seal isn't opening that at this moment. But He's coming. This is preparatory. The whole earth. This isn't symbolic. It's apocalyptic. This is, this is real. God is bringing universal judgment. How is it preparing the world for the end? Well, Peter made it clear, didn't he? That the heavens and the earth will be done away. 2 Peter 3.10 The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away and with a great noise the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. Verse 15 through 17 point us away from the universal destruction to people remaining. The description five words given in verse 15 describe the entire Roman population. The kings of the earth would be vassal kings who would serve under the Roman emperor. There were noblemen and princes who were officials in the like pro, proconsuls or governors running the government. There were the merchants. Revelation 18 talks about. There are generals of the military tribunes who control the armies. And then there's the wealthy, the noble class, the social elite, those who are landowners. And then there's the rest, the slave and the free. And literally, everyone alive at the time of John's writing this would find that class, a classification that fit them. And five of the classifications were of the elite. And two was everyone else. And boy, doesn't it seem like the elite's hunger for power is in a sense to preserve what they want, to protect and control. And sometimes we we get angst in our hearts against the elite because they're going to get something that the rest of us don't get. And sometimes that's propagated just to create more uncivil discord. But you know what John is pointing us to in this reality? That when the day of the Lord comes, it doesn't matter how much power 
or clout. It doesn't matter how many people you commanded. It doesn't matter how much land you own or wealth you have. When it comes to that day and that moment, what you're going to experience is sheer terror. Because they ask the question, who can stand the wrath of the Lamb? And when they see the earth shaking, the universal aspect of it is everyone remaining wants to say, I want to get away from the wrath of that face of God. I, they're begging for, 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 for a mudslide, an avalanche to come and that in some way they could be preserved or protected from this judgment. What does this show us? Not just that all will come under this judgment, but all deserve that judgment. Who do they cry out to? They're not crying out to the Lamb. Joel said, whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Because in this mountain, in this Jerusalem, they will be preserved. They'll find salvation there. But they're not calling out to that mountain. They're not calling out to the Lord. They're calling out to the created thing. The rocks! Rocks! Save me! Rocks! Rescue me! Protect me! I can't stand on my own. I'm so thankful today that there is one rock that we can cry out to. It is the solid and the permanent rock of ages that we can call out to for salvation today. Rock of ages, cleft for me, open for me, torn asunder for me, crucified for me, rent for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Where do you go for protection? Brother and sister, friend, those watching online, the Son of Man has not yet come. This is preparatory. It's getting us ready for that moment. And if you know this universal judgment is coming, and nothing, no position, no clout or status you have today can protect you in that day, get ready. And the only way to get ready is to acknowledge the Lamb as your Savior and Lord. Don't be a fool today. Don't reject Christ today. Receive Him. Submit to Him. Don't yearn for autonomy from your Creator. Bow in submission. Live a life for His glory. Five miles north of Mount St. Helens in the state of Oregon, there was a place called Spirit Lake. And there was a lodge on Spirit Lake that was um, taken care of by the man named Harry Truman. Not the president, but another man named Harry Truman. And in the early months of 1980, uh, the seismologists were getting readings and picking up all the signals that a terrible eruption was about to occur. And so uh, the rangers got busy herding people to safety and evacuating the area. And they, 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 called, they, they came to Harry Truman and, and challenged him, you need to leave, and, and we have the evidence and it's going to happen, but this guy refused to budge. They, he was warned, the residents begged him, his sister called him, but Harry Truman even went on national television laughing and said, nobody knows more about this mountain than Harry. It don't blow up on him. But it did. At 8.31 on the morning of May 18th, Mount St. Helen erupted and shook that place. Tons of disintegrated rock towered 10 miles into the air. Concussive waves raced down the mountain and leveled that lodge and Harry Truman in it. Today, I'm told that Harry Truman is considered kind of a, a folk hero in Oregon, kind of a legend. T-shirts are sold, beer mugs and posters 
with his face and name on it. An homage to a foolish man. A man who wouldn't listen to warnings. Who wouldn't prepare. And who was blasted into eternity. Revelation 6 provides us that warning. This shaking is coming. You need to get ready. Father in heaven, we bow in Jesus' name and we're humbled by what the wrath of the Lamb reveals to us. We see the depravity of our own heart. We recognize our own tendency to throw off your commands and live by our own laws and how it leads to strife, even among our relationships and our families and our friends. Father, I pray that you would steer us back to your word. We would hunger for it. That we would learn from it. That we would live it. That we would be witnesses. That we would have zeal as we go from this place, willing to endure the shame and the sacrifice that will come as we trust you in your sovereign plan. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who in their in their foolish mind, thinks that they can withstand this universal judgment in their own strength, that they would hear the reality of that moment. Who can stand? And the answer rings back, nobody apart from the Lamb. And I pray today, anybody watching or hearing this message would trust you, would turn from their pride, would heed the warning. And call out on the name of the Lord and find salvation in Mount Zion. Amen. 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 I invite you to remain seated, to bow your heads and close your eyes in a